Ya. Base. Turn up. Parents need more education Master options for their children. Teachers should be afforded more freedom to teach without big government interference. If we really want to make American education great again, the dollars to fund public education should follow the child. You're listening to the Ricky Revelations podcast. Here is your host, Richard Norman Ricky. Well, I've got with me today, my guest is Marsha Farney. I'm excited to have Marsha. Marsha is an educator, but she also was in the House of Representative, representing District 20, mm -hmm. which I believe is, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. Milano? Well, was it Milan? Milam. Milan? Milan. So it was Milam, parts of Williamson County. Yes. And Burnett? Correct. And that was who you represented. Yes. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about political stuff. We're going to talk okay. about public education, and All I right. want to talk to you about charter schools, because I know you were a real advocate for that. Absolutely. Currently an educator. Yes. with uh, Tell everybody what you do right now. I am so blessed to have the best job. I get to be a counselor at Gateway College Prep. I work with amazing students, impressive teachers, and very supportive administrators. It is a dream job for me. We we love to have you. Thanks for joining our team. Thank you. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your background. I know you were an ed educator and then mm -hmm. decided to become... Uh, a representative and get involved mm -hmm. in politics. Yes. What drove that decision? And well, I started off as a um, third grade teacher, and wound up being an award-winning classroom teacher, which for I uh, was in competition at the regional level to be teacher of the year. And but I left that position to go teach at Texas A&M. And I, excuse me, I was a fifth grade teacher as well. Third grade in one district, fifth grade in another. And then I went to go teach at Texas A&M in their College of Education. And that was a complete joy. It was a lot of fun. And getting to work with um, college juniors and seniors who were aspiring future public education uh, educators. So they had this missionary type zeal to want to make a difference, which I have as well. So I was very interested in helping them become the best possible teacher they could be. Got to work with some great people like Dr. Harry Wong, who wrote the first 100 days of school. He is the exemplar that you want to use for classroom discipline in a way that lifts the child up, gives them direction without shame, which is my motto. So I love doing that. Um, then when I came to um, Austin to finish my PhD, uh, I worked as a middle school counselor in Pflugerville for a while and was doing uh, educational consulting. I traveled all across the lower part of the United States, and that was a joy, working with administrators and teachers. Um, got my PhD in 2007, and by that time I had my third child, and he was in second grade, I believe, and I had the opportunity to speak with someone who was on the State Board of Education for my area, and I asked her a question about one of the schools, and she said, oh, I'm not, I don't do schools. That's not why I'm here. I'm wanting to do other things. I'm wanting to get liberalism out of our schools, and I said, oh, you don't visit the schools? And she said, no. And she, I said, do you have any intention to spend time in a classroom? And she did not. And that's when I determined I should use my background and my experience and my passion for supporting public education and all the wonderful things it does at that capacity. So you, was, you, were, you were a school teacher for how, long were, how many years in the classroom? Um, let me see. It, I was in third grade, I guess, and then fifth grade. I think it was a total of like eight years, eight or oh, nine wow. years. Okay. Well, then help me with this. Why are we having such a teacher shortage, and why is it that so many new teachers find that they're overwhelmed and they just don't last and become mm -hmm. five-year teachers? They're one and done. What's going on? I would like to see it to be automatic because in many school districts, they assign you a mentor. And to me, you should have a mentor who still has that joy. Mm -hmm. And when you have, like we have now, when we have supportive administrators who allow you to be more flexible in your learning, to use blended learning, to use flip lessons, to be able to not just want the straight rows of quiet children, but children working together where there's interactive lessons going on. I think if you are able to give that teacher that flexibility to let them teach and not be married to a teacher's manual. When I first started, I was using the teacher manual, and it literally tells you when to point to the board. Mm -hmm. And so I put that down. 
And I told, I began doing what I knew I was, which was a teacher. And what a difference that made in my students. I still remember one time I passed out the worksheet to the third graders to do something else, the lesson on contractions. And they, I did everything the book said, passed out the worksheet, took up the grades. The children did not make good grades. And I passed them back out to the kids. Then I said, you know what? Give those back to me. And I said, this is not your fault. I did not do a good job teaching this. So tomorrow, when you come to school, it's going to be the best day you've had yet because Miss Marsha is going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. And I did. I decided my, te my principal let me be creative. And I used a medical analogy because you have to know your students. And every year, your classroom's different. So I had several students whose parents were involved in the medical field. So I taught contractions, wearing a medical jacket with a stethoscope around my neck. And I went and got tongue depressed and we got ice cream sticks, and we learned it is, is whenever you have tonsils removed that it's you cut something out with a scalpel and add your stitch, which is your contraction. So I'll bet you there were a couple of kids that took those uh, sticks and decided to use them for, you know, <laughs> swatting somebody. Or no, no but they probably, loved, they probably <laughs> loved it. So, you know, this is my thing. So if, if you're a teacher, if you fail everybody in your class, maybe it's you. I think that for me, yes. You believe that. I believe all students can learn. It's up to me to do the right yeah. job, to where yeah. I explain it in a way. And I have no problem with, if I'm seeing something in a way that doesn't make sense, I will ask my students, can someone else explain this in a way? That's my job, is for them yeah. to learn. Yeah. And if it means someone else explains it in their own terminology, I'm all for it. Yeah. So I trained my teachers uh -huh. to consider that they were wearing a tool belt. And you have all these different yeah. tools, and you must be flexible, yeah. because every child deserves an opportunity to flourish. Yeah, good teachers are flexible. Good teachers have good mentors, and they yes. have supportive, supportive administrators to help them yeah. get through those first years or two. Yeah, so that was a long answer a lot of to how to discipline. retain teachers. Well, and before we get into your role in politics and being a representative, let, let's, let's dive a little bit into you're in public education, and so you've been teaching for several years. You've seen a lot of schools. You mm -hmm. believe in it. You love public education. When did you start to hear about public charter schools? Um, was that before you became uh, a state representative? Or? I remember uh, Governor Bush talking about wanting to have laboratories of innovation. And I thought, ooh, that sounds good, because I'm a very strong proponent of public education and being making good use of those taxpayer dollars in the public schools. I love the idea of that school choice where parents could choose a different school within the public school system. That was doing something maybe if your child learns differently, which is perfectly fine, to be able to go there. So I remember hearing that. When I was running for the uh, State Board of Education, um, I remember some of... Um, then President Bush's former cabinet members were in education, were wanting to know why I was running for office and what I supported. And so that mattered to me also that they knew that I was going to support charters, because, and I still do. I have visited as a, as a legislator and as a State Board of Education member, I've probably visited 14, 15 different charters, oh, good, some good multiple times. So good I feel like I can speak with... Um, some experience, mm. personal experience, mm. firsthand mm. knowledge. Yeah. The charter schools I visited are extremely impressive. So let make sure the our, our viewers understand this. So you went in, you were a state board of education member mm -hmm. first before yes, you became a representative. Yes, sir. And while you were on state board of education, you began to hear about this charter school thing and you knew mm -hmm. that there were some people in, you know, the governor at the time wanted to see some more choice. Mm -hmm. And right away you said Oh, that's a, that's a good thing. Seems like we should have more choice in the public school system. Yes, especially for me. Um, my views, I tend to, I like to think, and I hope it's correct, that I, I, my views are based on evidence-based research because my views can change because based on that. But to me, evidence-based research supports what the Texas Constitution says it's the duty of the legislature to provide for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of 
public free schools. So I've been a big proponent of that because, as you know, the history of education, which my dissertation, by the way, 600-page doorstop, is uh, all about the history of education in Georgetown, which I think is a very good school system. And it talked about from 18, I think, 50 or 60 through desegregation. I learned a lot about the way schools were formed, a lot of the support, some of the pitfalls they had, and things of that nature. So I realized used to only the white males were the ones who were predominantly getting an education. And then eventually only if you were taxpayers and yeah. things like that, if you own property. And then to realize the whole premise of this back in uh, when they first started the public schools or started our constitution, it specifically wants every child, every Texan to have the opportunity, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of your gender, regardless of your color or ethnicity, to have the access, a level ground to succeed and be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. So that propelled me to want to support, and I do support very strongly, public education. When you when you came aware of the charter school movement and you started to support it, there are, there are people in the traditional public school system mm -hmm. that don't support charter schools. In fact, they're enemies. I've got a book, <laughs> Charter Schools and Their Enemy, Enemies, oh. by Thomas Sowell. I don't know if you've read it. It's a great book. It's only two years old now. I ran, in, I, I ran into a lot of this opposition myself when I decided mm -hmm. to start our charter school. As I found out real soon, there were people out there in the traditional public school system who didn't like charter schools, don't want us around, and feel like it's taking money away from the public school system. So not everybody loves it. I'm glad you do. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned, boy, ooh, whew, there's some opposition. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of organizations still here in Texas now that are putting a lot of money into stopping charter schools, decreasing the number of charter schools, and, and whatnot. But you were supportive, and you got into the, the legislation. You became mm -hmm. a representative. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you, you won an award. It was the Charter School Champion Award by oh, yes. the Texas yes. Public Charter School Association. Is that who yes. gave that to you? Yes. Okay. So what did, you, what did you do to get some award like that from the charter school movement? I was very enthusiastic about supporting the charter schools by carrying legislation and advocating for it to other House members. So first of all, being able to support it in the fact of helping it get a hearing in the Public, Edu Public Education Committee, then getting on the House floor and working the members to let them know uh, the evidence-based research that was supporting what we were wanting and to bring more equity and bring more things to support this because parents are choosing this. And it is part of the public school system that I feel is um, there's no questionable constitutionality about it because it is established there and we're supposed to support the support maintenance. And this is another part of it. So I had no problem supporting it. And by the way, I have some dear friends who absolutely oppose this. We have exact opposite views on this. Mm -hmm. But sure. I don't change my opinions um, and neither do they based on our feelings or emotions. For me, this is evidence-based research shows <coughs> that charters, if they are well run, like Orinda is, they can do great things. And we love our sister schools. I consider our area schools here sister schools. Mm. I have visited, I've been volunteered and worked in many, and I have nothing but praise for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we can live and work together. So I supported legislation for them in a variety of ways. Um, and it was my pleasure and I would do it again. Yeah, I like to tell everybody, Look, I don't believe charter schools are the panacea for what ails public education. I, I really yeah. don't. I think we serve a niche, mm -hmm. and we should be a partner with mm -hmm. the traditional public schools. Mm -hmm. Anytime I hear staff members with Arenda get real negative toward traditional public schools, I'd like to correct them and say, let me tell you something. Yeah. They've got a tough job, too. Yes. You know? Yes. And there's things that we do well, and there's things that we don't do well, and there's right. things that they do well, and I think we can all work together. Amen. But the real conflict comes when we're talking about divvying up the money, yeah. okay? Because that's really what this is about. Right. There are, there are superintendents who say some really nasty th things about charter schools, who don't want them coming into their districts. Mm. In fact, some of them flat out lie. And I'll give you one example. I won't name who, but, I, but, I, but I've faced him. I've, I've faced this particular superintendent in, in a very prominent school district here in Texas across a committee meeting with the UIL. Mm -hmm. And I knew exactly what his stance was because I read all of his literature. And he would put something out to his community saying, you know, charter schools have more money than traditional ISDs. They get more money. Mm -hmm. And he was referring to a state allocation. Mm -hmm. 
Now, just based on the state allocation, charter schools get a little more money because what charter schools don't get is they get no, they have no taxing authority, get no local tax revenues. Right. And so the state says, because we're not going to allow charter schools to be a taxing authority and get local revenues from taxes, we're going to make up some of that gap mm -hmm. by giving you a little more of the state allocation. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't tell anybody that. Mm -hmm. And he's been so opposed that he's making sure everybody knows why you should oppose this. And there's other literature that's put out there. Mm -hmm. How do, we, how do we get our public school traditional superintendents and traditional school board members to be not anathema toward charter schools? What would you say is the solution to try to keep it, bring this about where we're growing? Because right now, there's a movement. Um, I can tell you who some of these organizations are. Raise Your Hands Texas, uh, the Texas School Alliance, the Texas Association of School Boards, the Association of Texas Professional Educators, who are spending a lot of money on anti-charter school legislation. They like to see fewer charter schools. Mm -hmm. They don't want them coming into the communities. And so there's a battle going on about do we want to have more charter schools in Texas mm -hmm. or should we have fewer? And mm -hmm. there's so, people on both sides of that. Right. But right. it's because of the money. So I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> but what do we say to our parents? What, what should they be doing to make sure that their choice isn't being compromised or taken away mm -hmm. from them? Because that can still happen. Mm -hmm. All it takes is new mm -hmm. legislators coming in, a new governor who are anti charter school. Right. What are we going to tell our parents right now about, hey, be aware of this? Right. I think they need to realize what school choice really is and that we have that. We actually have school choice where parents are making the choice. Parents can choose to send their child to a school district or to the uh, area charter school. Parents have that right and that authority. And I think parents need to be aware of what school choice actually is, what we actually already have here. And that they, I'm, I'm very big on parents being involved. Hmm. When another neighboring school district had a huge uh, school board um, conflict going on, I thought it was actually good that parents were getting involved. Parents need to be involved in everything that we do, I think, in our schools. And you need to know what's being taught. That's why I think it's so important mm -hmm. uh, to know what the curriculum is. That's mm -hmm. no secret Should at a, a public secret. school. There's no secret where yeah. the money goes. There's no secret yeah. if it's a public school. And parents yeah. have the right to know that. As far as how to <coughs> fix this, and I will say, Raise Your Hand Texas, I think, is a wonderful organization. I, I do, too. I do, too. And, they do a lot so of great things. Tasby. They do a lot of great things for public schools. They yes, do. And they do. I enjoy, I've worked with them and I think they're awesome. I just have a different point of view on yeah. this about our charters. Yeah. I would love to see if, if our, some of our public school systems wanted to, the traditional districts to incorporate charters to work with them or to maybe even have a charter on their campus. Um, well, I, I think, you know, traditional, traditional public schools can have a charter school. Yes. I mean, there's very few of them that do that. Mm -hmm. Most of the Texas public charter schools are run by 501c3 not-for-profit organizations. Yes. So Texas University can have a charter school. I think we may have a couple. I'm not sure. I know we have one municipal charter school in Texas. It's called Westlake up near the South Lake, mm -hmm. north of Dallas area. And UT has a charter school. Does UT have one? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are, there's a few of those, but most of them are, are with not-for-profit organizations that have their own governance structure. Mm -hmm. And when somebody says, well, let's, let's, put charters under traditional school districts, oh, my hair goes up and I go, oh, no, 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 you don't want that mm -hmm. because what we're, what charters are supposed to be is independent and more yes. free to be innovative and yes. unique. And some of that is, right. is, is the key is your governance structure. Right. And if you put it inside of a traditional school district, that mm -hmm. governance structure is completely different. There's mm -hmm. pros and cons to that structure, mm -hmm. I believe. And there's pros and cons to a private not-for-profit governance structure. Mm -hmm. It works great when the school charter school is doing really well, and you go, right. man, we love that there's consistency among their board right. members, and they mm -hmm. all agree with the targets and what mm -hmm. the mission is and what the goals are. And your traditional public school has people coming in and out as they get elected or not, mm -hmm. or, do, or don't get elected, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. the makeup of the board changes, and they have right. different goals and different objectives. And then the superintendent, who was hired by one set of board members, four years later has got a whole new set of board members, which yes. doesn't always work out really yes. well. So there's pros and cons to that. Right. But I, I, oh boy, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't want to see charters become under any other bigger organization mm -hmm. because I, we need to be left alone, accountable, even more accountable. I'm all, oh, for, yeah. I'm, I'm all for that, going back to that evidence-based. Yes. 
And I think we both agree, looking at the evidence, mm -hmm. clearly charter schools have had a positive influence mm -hmm. on public education outcomes. Right. If you look at the scores, absolutely. You can't deny that. We, we know I, that. I would like to see the um, school districts and the charters find a way to work together collaboratively <coughs> to avoid... <coughs> Um, I'll just jump into the fray here. No, go for it. I, I'm, I about go for the, it. Uh, yeah. About the voucher circumstances situation, because with that, there is zero accountability and zero transparency is the way it's wanting to be passed. And the sad thing is, as someone who supports private schools, I think they are fantastic and I support that completely. But when you take taxpayer dollars, because the government didn't have any money, taxpayers, they take yeah, our money. Yeah, it's my money. So yeah. when taxpayer dollars go somewhere, like you know how it is, the way we have to trace the money all the way through, even like a purchase order from the office, it has to be approved here, be approved here, be approved here. And it takes a, t a while for that process because we are accountable mm -hmm. to that and we have to report. Um, I wish we could come together and realize charters are the best option for school choice, I believe, um, here in Texas. Well, it, but it's capped. I mean, there's still a cap on how many charters are being allowed. And expansion uh, is an issue, too. Yeah, well, the expansion, yeah, because there's a cap. Mm -hmm. And, w you know, we're, we in the charter community are trying to, we're advocating for, for some new laws and mm -hmm. trying to open some things up. There are certain, what we've run into is in certain cities, um, they don't. They make it so difficult for new charter schools to open up. Mm -hmm. uh, city codes, all kinds of issues, mm -hmm. because there's people within the city council who, for some reason, don't want that. Maybe because they feel like they're being supported by the traditional school districts mm -hmm. who lobby and have a lot of money, a lot of power. They employ mm -hmm. a lot of people, mm -hmm. and they want those votes. And so, hey, you know, don't support this charter school. It's taking money away from us. <laughs> um, so we have a real, we, we have an issue there. We'd like to see uh, we'd like to see more charters come on board. Uh, we'd like to see the cities be a little more open. To, you know, don't make it so difficult for, for charters to come in here. Um, I think a legitimate concern that traditional school districts should have is the following. It concerns money. School districts have to always anticipate what their enrollment's going to be. How, mm -hmm. what, what are the demographics? You'll, you'll see a board meetings, they'll call, they'll bring in some expert to come in and look at the demographics and give them a report and say, hey, here's what your growth numbers look like, mm -hmm. here's how many students you're going to have in the next five, ten years, and so you need to buy some more land, you need to be prepared for this. And that's what school districts go on, right? And that's all taxpayer money. It's going to pay for all these new buildings. All of a sudden, the charter comes along and opens up right dab in the middle of their school district, mm -hmm. and they don't really see it coming. And it's going to take 800 kids away from their school district. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a school of choice, so, you know, Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you're losing kids. It's your own fault. But, mm -hmm. hey, I don't think that should happen either, especially when you need, uh, being somebody who's built a lot of schools, and I know what it takes, I know how hard it is, I think people should have a lot more, you know, they should see out ahead a lot with a lot more time mm -hmm. to be able to prepare for this. So that's a legitimate complaint that I think traditional schools have against charter schools just kind of popping up. Yeah, they get a notice. You're mm -hmm. supposed to notify them that, hey, we're going to expand and come into your area. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe any of their comments matters to the Texas Education Commissioner or the State Board of Education once they've approved the charter. I, I don't think that, do you? I mean, d were you aware that there was some comments made by a traditional school district that stopped the charter from coming in? No, I no. wasn't. I know when I was there, the rule changed when I was there, uh, when I was on the state board, because we were the ones who were able to um, determine whether or not a charter went forward or not. Mm -hmm. And we were doing the vetting, and we had a specific committee that did that, then the whole board did the final vote. We were able to ask questions and things like that. And it's since changed where Commissioner Morath was then yeah, had the did. one. But uh, yeah. uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick came and spoke to me and told me that that was... <laughs> He said that he actually gave, a, gave the state board more power because they had the final veto, but they only are able to veto what comes through that has to be approved, you know, from yeah. the commissioner. Yeah. So it's changed that way. But um, I don't, I was not aware of that, no. Yeah, no, and I think, I think they should have more time. I think that process needs to be looked at mm -hmm. for sure. But... Um, I think there's ways to get around that, maybe with a lot more notice than what they're given. I know we as charters would certainly like to know when we apply for a new campus, mm -hmm. 
we have to do it within a very short time frame. And I know one of the bills that we're trying to pass is, look, let's, let's allow us to have 30, whatever the month, I think it's 32 months, I could be mm -hmm. wrong on that, uh, rather than, you know, the 18, um, to start a new campus. A lot goes into that. Mm -hmm. we, we need more time so that if we get approval and you say, the commissioner says, yes, I'm going to allow you to open up a new campus now, then we still have a couple more years to find that location, to kind of put out our bids and kind of get that going. So that's another, mm -hmm. that's another area that I think we, we can improve some things. So mm -hmm. I think we agree on that. Now, you, you, were, you were getting into school, school vouchers, but before we do, let's just, let's just sort of stick with the charter school things. I think, I think we're going someplace with this. When you look at this, the statistics, what do you believe are the reasons why charter schools, in many instances, seem to do better in certain communities compared to the traditional public schools that they're surrounded by? It, what, what, what does it make them special and unique? Why, how can a charter school in the midst of San Antonio mm -hmm. come along and their scores are dramatically better mm -hmm. than some of the traditional schools that, are, that surround that charter school? What, what, what goes into a great school? Well, there, there are so many regulations on the public school system. It's just almost abhorrent. That's the reason I find it particularly offensive that they would take taxpayer dollars with zero accountability or transparency to someone else when public schools and public charters have to jump through a million hoops and all this reporting. Some larger school districts have to hire someone, some extra people just to do all the reporting. It is a lot, especially for big districts. When I visited Harmony up in uh, Houston area, Char charter They're school. one of their mm -hmm. charters, yeah. yes. I was very impressed with the way they were running things there. And they had a lot of hands-on projects they were actually doing beyond, um, like say for instance, instead of PowerPoint presentations, they were already doing prezies back years ago, which a prezi presentation is more mind-blowing with things they do. They were more innovative, at, but they had more flexibility to do things like that. And that's what makes charters, I think, so in, so invaluable to the public school system is that we are supposed to be laboratories of innovation and that we do have more flexibility in some things. Um, I think it's unfortunate we can get mired down with, uh, like I said, the long rows, the quiet children, the worksheet mania, what I call work, too much of an emphasis on worksheets instead of other ways of teaching and learning. But when you have all this accountability that goes with that star test, and I know even now all of teachers all across the state are shifting over to preparation for star testing, which means more worksheet, which is less interesting to a child. And so that, that to me, is a problem. I, you know, one of the other benefits of charter schools is I, I'm convinced, I know this for a fact, that I know it has helped some of the traditional public schools become more innovative, mm -hmm. to change and yeah. say, you know what, we got this new competition around here and we may lose more kids. Let's look at our own systems and the way we school kids and maybe we should do something. And many of them have. Many of them have become more innovative. I don't think there's that much of a difference legally in what you can do or can't do. Mm -hmm. I think people often get surprised if you look at the laws that the charter schools have to follow and the laws that public schools have to follow, and they're almost exactly the same, mm -hmm. okay? Um, Charter schools can cap how many kids they serve, and that's a big deal, right? I mean, we can only take so many kids because we don't have taxing authority. We don't get tax. We can't just all of a sudden, you know, add more school campuses when our enrollment's growing. Mm -hmm. So we don't have as much money. So they allow us that freedom you can cap. But, but in terms of innovation, I think most traditional schools, especially now with the School of Innovation movement, mm -hmm. they can do a lot more of that, and many of them are. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. So I would, one of the arguments I would make for charter schools coming along is that, hey, they've also improved the traditional public education system. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a win-win to me, right? Mm -hmm. You, you just brought up START. I, I, I'd love to talk to you about this a little bit before we, we close down the podcast, because I, I've got some thoughts about that. Let me, just, let me just lay this out and then see what you think about it. Okay. We spend a lot of money on STAR testing. I don't think people have any idea. I didn't know. I came into education. My background was originally in education. Then I became a healthcare executive, a hospital CEO, and then I got into this charter school thing kind mm -hmm. of by accident. And then I've learned a lot. One of the things I learned is, oh, my goodness, this, this STAR exam thing is a huge 800-pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. uh, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the test from the mm -hmm. testing company. Mm -hmm. But that's not the full price of it. The full price of it is the time that you, Marcia, spend mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And all the teachers spend it administrating every single time there's a STAR right. exam. Mm -hmm. It's all hands on deck. Everybody stops mm -hmm. for those days, mm -hmm. and they all monitor the hallways, they monitor the restrooms, they monitor everything, and the kids are taking this exam. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the information you get is way too late. Mm -hmm. In terms of money well spent, is STAR a good bang for the buck, do you believe, in our public education system? No, I no, do you don't. Oh, and I will tell you huh. this: I like what a lot of schools are doing now. What we are doing, we will take a um, we they call them benchmarks, but yeah. we try to see where the kiddo is at the beginning, yeah. where they are in the middle, and then we do almost individual education plans for practically every child yeah. to figure out where their weakness is, where their strength is. There's tutoring in the morning, there's tutoring in the afternoon. Yeah. I even will pull some kids in and do tutoring during lunch and say, "Sweetheart, let me see what you're doing. Show me what does this question say." You know, and I. I teach strategies on studying and how to do better with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm also mm -hmm. spending time teaching about how to reduce stress and handle anxiety. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's literally, mm -hmm. I've, I've been teaching things like that to my students and to my teachers. And I tell them if they will just sit back and do the breathing and just to relax and to let their frontal lobe be cleared and let this amygdala go crazy on them like that they can access those files of what they've learned and to trust their studying and to trust their efforts. Mm. You know, as you know, our school is rated 96 out of 100 from TEA. Yeah. Our school has done great things. I don't think there's any way we could say this has not been a success story. That's why I'm so proud <clears throat> to be a part of it. But we focus on learning, and we do, even though we have yeah. packed classrooms. Yeah. Some of our classrooms have, like, I was in one the other day, they had, like, I think 30 kids. Yeah. It was packed in that one classroom and to work with them all was a challenge. Yeah. But every yeah. one of those kids wounds up with almost an identity, with a, their own individualized education plan once because we see where you're weak. Yeah. They, the teachers do that and support them. Um, and so the STAR test to me, by the way, I didn't think we should go with the companies. I felt we should let our major universities come up with a yeah. test yeah. and let them provide that instead of going with a company. Yeah, I, uh, I think that it's too much you know, what you're talking about, we call just-in-time assessments, which is the way yeah. to go. They're just, yeah. just, you know, hey, we yeah. got it. We, we need to figure out where, where are the kids at right now and intervene right away and not yeah. wait two years. And, and the good schools do that sort of thing. But I think every community is different. And what one community wants out of its school may be different than another community. And mm -hmm. to try to standardize those. I get it. I get it. We, there's got to be some way to measure how our kids are doing. I just think this is yeah. too much. Yeah. And I don't think it's the right measurement. And uh, I, I want to be held accountable. I think we should all be held yes. accountable. Yes. We're not afraid of accountability. We're not afraid of accountability. No. But what we're looking for and what we believe is success may be a little different. And let, let our parents decide. My yeah. gosh. I mean, I, oh, it's, just, it's just driving me crazy. The amount of waste I see in education mm -hmm. is, is, well, bo is bothersome. When I came out of health care, I, I know there's a lot of regulation in health care, too. But the regulation that goes on here, mm -hmm. I mean, people complain about how much we have to spend on administration. Oh, how come we're not paying? I go, guys, you realize how many reports they have to do in the office to get, every, to get the money to pay you? That's I mean, right. if they miss one report and it's not in on time, all of a sudden the checks don't come in mm -hmm. and we don't, can't deposit the money mm -hmm. and you can't. I know mm -hmm. it seems ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I wish you didn't have to spend that much on administration. Yeah. It's stifling. It's stifling. Yeah. All the state, all the feds, all the different reports, all the accountability. Nobody trusts anybody. So we're all spending <laughs> most of our day proving right. that we're really doing good things. And That's the simple right. solution is just take our dang scores. That's right. You know, and if the parents like it, they're going to keep sending their kids. It's That's pretty right. much, leave us alone. <laughs> but no. Well, no. do you know, one of the things that I think is problematic about the STAR is that it's punitive instead of diagnostic. Diagnostic yeah. is what we do yeah. at the beginning. And that's what I think a lot of schools, public schools, are doing along the way. Yeah. Is, and that's where I think if we could show growth, if they would let us do a test at the beginning yeah. and do the, maybe the same test, just the different types of questions at the end, that shows growth. Yeah. And that's authentic. And I think that's yeah. valid and yeah. that's reliable. And it shows if we are actually having growth. Yeah. Every kid's different. Every kid has different abilities. Yeah. We want to just show that we can get a kid from point A to point Z. Just, Absolutely. Just, wa just watch us. It may Absolutely. take this kid a little longer because yep. he doesn't have those set of skills, doesn't have yep. those challenges, you know? Mm -hmm. Every kid's different. So anyway, Marcia, thanks. I enjoy this. We go on forever. I want to have you back, and I want to talk uh, about your job now as a counselor at the school, a little bit yes. about mental health and kids and what yep. you're seeing going on in, in, in the kids emotionally and yep. 
spiritually and, and how that impacts what's going on in the classroom. So I look forward to that discussion too. It would be my pleasure. I love my students and I am their advocate, so I would love to Thanks. come back. Thanks. Appreciate Thank you. it. Turn up.